All right. Um, we go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll jump into Zechariah chapter 11. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for our time once again together. Uh, as men gathering here, we Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for the, the women that are gathering as well in the main sanctuary. Just bless their time as well. Lord, just uh, open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your word. Um, Lord, there's, there's just so much uh, to be uncovered in your word, and uh, it's just sometimes so difficult to get it all out and, and share it in a short amount of time. Um, so, Lord, I just pray that you would um, go before my word and help uh, whatever I might say. Uh, Lord, obviously that it would be your words and not mine, but it will just maybe trigger something for each and every one of us here to go back and dig into it a little deeper. There's a, starting to get into some very prophetic um, areas of, of this book, and uh, Lord, I just pray that um, uh, maybe other people that are more diligent or more apt to, to pull out all those different prophecies are able to, to do so. And, but Lord, we're going to talk about a couple tonight, and Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity. Lord, we just pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. First off, I want to just start with this real quick again. I think everyone that was here last week is here this week. Um, so this is nothing new. Same uh, red arrow pointing to Zechariah. You can see in the timeline uh, where he's contemporary with Haggai, um, prophesying up until the point uh, almost where the temple was completed being rebuilt. Um, I think I mentioned last week that his last recorded Prophecy was around 518 BC, about three years before the temple actually got completed. But he's around during the working on and completion of the temple. And also, just to, to clear up something last week, um, we were talking about the Holy Spirit and trying to be uh, active and listening to the prompting of that still small voice. And I uh, I thrown out a, a devotional uh, that I thought that devotional came from that day that I was teaching, and I, I misquoted it in the sense that I meant, I, I said it was from the morning and evening, evening devotional by Spurgeon, but it wasn't. I went through that devotional last year. So this year, I'm doing My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. So this is the cap, the, you know, August 13th was last Tuesday, when I was talking about the devotional I read this morning, which was last Tuesday, was from My Utmost for His Highest. This one, you know, do not quench the spirit. You know, I know you probably can't read it, but I just want to sh show you proof of <laughs> what I was actually talking about. In case somebody went back and said, pulled out their morning and evening by Spurgeon and said, that's not August 13th. This doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit. Um, but so, uh, I still recommend you going through that at some point in time. But um, uh, Oswald Chambers, these the devotionals also are similar to Spurgeon in the sense that, you know, they're short. But I often have to read through it twice and three times to get, capture the whole thing. Um, it, it's not the sense. It's not because of the the writing, but there's just so much. I think the Spurgeon one was more old English, so that one was just harder to understand and read. Uh, for that reason, the, this one, my album score is highest, is just harder to read or harder. Just not simple because there's so much content that he tries to cram into such a short devotion. Uh, and sometimes it's not real clear till I get to the very end what the rest of the page was all about. So I have to go back to the top and read it again. Oh, that makes more sense now. Mm -hmm. Just like any book you have, you may sometimes have to reread a paragraph or a, a page to get the to capture. Uh, sometimes I try to read it through too quickly, uh, as we've all have probably done. Um, read anything too fast, you're not ca going to capture all the details. So I just wanted to throw that in there. In case anybody wants to go back and look at August 13th about uh, not quenching the Holy Spirit. All right, um, I'm not going to give you any more of an overview about the book of Zechariah. I, I did an overview, uh, short summary, um, last week, so that's already recorded. So if anybody's watching this on the YouTube channel, you can go back to Zechariah chapter 11 and get a little bit of uh, overview, um, or just go back and listen to all the different uh, chapters uh, that have already been taught on and recorded. Uh, the same YouTube channel that you're looking at now. All right, chapter 11. Let's go ahead and jump in, verses 1 and 2. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cypress, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty trees are ruined. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. 
to Lebanon. Where is Lebanon? I showed a map also last week uh, that shows it up along the northwest coast, uh, north of, of the, <coughs> the Mediterranean Sea, um, but certainly north and northwest of where Israel is at on the map as well. So just the fact that it's from in the north is just one little key point that I'll mention about in just a few seconds. But Lebanon was known for its beautiful and fragrant uh, cedar trees, um, and in different passages of scripture, uh, especially in the time of King David and King Solomon, both of those men uh, inquired from the kings and the people that were ruling Lebanon back in their day, which was about 1000 BC, 500 years previous or prior to Zechariah, roughly, in time, timeline, uh, but King David and King Solomon, they, I think it was King, not Heman, but started with an H. Um, I'm just going from memory right now, but anyhow, there's a king there that offered to chop down, saw down a lot of cedar trees. You know what it was? Hiram. Hiram, okay. Um, it started with an H. <laughs> and uh, they floated down tons and tons and tons of these cedar trees from Lebanon down the coast, and then they had to bring them in, inland uh, for basically Solomon to, to build the temple with. Um, so that's where a lot of the cedar trees uh, came from that ended up getting used in Jerusalem for multiple purposes. The temple being one of them and another one being actually King Solomon's palace uh, that he actually built as well. Um, so Lebanon is to the north of Israel where the eventual uh, Roman army would come from when they came to overthrow Jerusalem. So this theme of Roman Conquest is going to come up in a couple of these um, scriptures that we're going to be uh, talking about here in Zechariah chapter 11. And the cypress trees that is also mentioned here, um, that name of a tree can also go by uh, another name of a cypress tree, a juniper tree or a fir tree, I think is what maybe the King James uh, calls them as a fir tree. Symbolically, so why are these trees wailing? Obviously, you know, trees don't physically wail. So symbolically, why are they wailing? And we're going to find out a little bit later, you know, there's basically have been a lot of bad shepherds, a lot of bad rulers. We touched on this a little bit last week uh, that have been ruling in Jerusalem for many, many years. Um, so that's what this prophecy is, is kind of alluding to, uh, what the Lord is speaking to Zechariah about. Prophetically, though, uh, these first two verses, verses 1 and 2, speak to the destruction of Israel by the Roman government. Uh, again, we're going to touch on that a little bit more upcoming. It's a little bit more explicit in, in the upcoming verses. So prophetically, it's about the, the Roman, uh, Romans basically coming down and conquering uh, Jerusalem, but which doesn't also happen for another 550 years or so from this time. Uh, we know of Jerusalem actually being conquered, conquered completely, um, basically around 70 A.D. This is, remember, about 520-ish uh, B.C., right now in the time of Zechariah. Roughly. So verse 3. Uh, there is the sound of wailing shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. So these evil shepherds were oppressing the people of Jerusalem. Uh, there's a, a lot of these verses I found as I was trying to really pull out what the meaning of was it, of what the verse was trying to say, was that there's a lot of prophetic meaning, and then there's somewhat of a literal meaning as well. Um, uh, I'm not ashamed to say that it's easier for me to see the literal meaning in everything, and it's harder for me to find out the prophetic meaning. So as we're reading through here, I may skip over something that's plain as day, prophetic meaning to one of you in the room, and, and you're, you're going to want to raise your hand and say, Tom, what about this and what about that? That's fine. Uh, uh, that's good. Bring it up at the end, or because I'd love to talk about it, because I'm sure I'm going to miss uh, a few things. But So I'm going to, as a couple verses, I'm going to mention you know, what I think the literal meaning is, and then throw in a prophetic meaning as well. Some of them are more obvious than, than others. 
So the lions will, so it's talked about these lions roaring. So why is this? Well, the lions, in, back in Judah in the day, in this area of Israel, uh, you know, there, there were physical lions, uh, wild roaming beasts uh, in the land in 500 and in 1000 BC. Um, as you go through some of the Old Testament scriptures, uh, there's stories of, you know, the wild beasts tearing apart men. Um, so, and who was the one that was very strong and this lion attacked him and he took hold of his mouth and kind of ripped his mouth open, the lion. And then days later he came, or I don't know how long, long it was days, maybe a week later he came back and there was a, a beehive uh, in the carcass of this lion that he had torn apart. Anybody remember the name? Samson. Samson. And so we know that there were these wild beasts that roamed the land, so yes, the lions in Judah were roaring. Uh, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. Uh, so they, they may have been roaring because we have all these trees being literally, again, this is a literal interpretation. Uh, back in the first verse, we talked about the cedars coming down, the cypress trees coming down, and the mighty oaks coming down. And this was something that would happen when conquering nations would come into an area. Oftentimes, they would clear-cut the land. Uh, just to destroy whatever fruit trees that may have been there, or just to bring down the forest, or to use the wood as an embankment, to, to build an embankment against whatever walls they may be coming against. So when you do that to the land, uh, take away all the brush and take away all the timber, the forest, because again it said there in verse 1 that the thick forest has come down. So what are you left with? A lot of times bare ground, and when the rains come, you end up washing away a lot of the soil and the dirt, and uh, it takes much, much, much longer for things to regrow. So the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. So the, the lions were roaring, maybe because this thicket that they were used to around the Jordan River and in the forest is now gone, because the Romans had uh, prophesying that the Romans would are going to take away all the, the forest. The, the, yeah, the forest and the trees. So the Romans could have cut down many of the trees like previous nations had done, like Babylon had done as well when they came to conquer Jerusalem. And so again, we end up with soil erosion and the thicket around the river being taken away. So a literal interpretation of that could be why the lions are roaring. Verse 4 and 5. Thus says the Lord my God, feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. So Zechariah was commanded to feed or pasture the flock of God's people, Israel, knowing it was eventually destined for slaughter. Again, this is prophetically knowing that something is going to happen much later in the future. So verse 5 whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. History tells us that through the writing of Josephus, this is something that, um, uh, again, I heard through a, another Bible teacher sharing that he had um, dug up some information about the, the ancient writer of Josephus, that when Titus Vespasian, when he came to conquer, he was the Roman leader at the time of 70 AD when they came to Jerusalem, when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, this took over a year before they could finally uh, break down the walls and before the people succumbed to the, uh, to the Romans, that people resorted to cannibalism, and as people were just kind of wasting away inside the city walls, there was uh, a plague that fell in, so the people were eventually thrown over the wall if they died and were infected with the plague. And Titus Vespasian is outside the walls just watching all this carnage happen. And, you know, this is happening slowly over a long piece of time. And Joseph records, or Josephus records, that Titus was begging them at one point or another to surrender. And at one point lifts his voice to the heavens and says, God, forgive me, and don't hold me accountable for this. This is not what I intended. So, he... He was sorry for what was happening, but it wasn't what he was attended, intended. But it, so the, it was speculation that he felt no guilt, but yet at the same time Josephus records that maybe he did feel guilt 
Um, but that was the only instance where I could find something that who would feel no guilt about something like this happening. Um, and it's possible that it was Titus, but again, Josephus records that he was kind of remorseful that it had to happen this way. Um, but it was um, that's one thing that I found in history that could uh, answer this question. Well, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt? I can't imagine not feeling guilty about that had happened. But I'm sure that Titus was probably coming to the city hoping that it was just going to be a quick conquest, but it wasn't. It took a long time. I'm going to open the door. I'm hot. There's something that light shining down. All right, verse 6. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord, but indeed I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. The petty tyrants and oppressors will fall victim to foreign kings who eventually attack the land, is what I got out of this verse. And a possible um, better take on this verse is that the Lord here predicts that the Roman troops will come and the power of government will be taken away from Israel, and the people of Israel will be dispersed. The people of Israel will be dispersed. Verse 7. So I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bonds, and I fed the flock. So in obedience to God's commands, Zechariah pastured the flock, which was doomed for slaughter. So just as um, uh, most shepherds, they had to carry around, uh, sometimes you might see a, a staff being mentioned that they carried around, or a rod. Uh, oftentimes they carry both. I, I heard in, or read in one commentary, I think it was my study Bible, that said kind of, that one was used for protection, like the rod was, I guess, a little bit longer and maybe more stout, for warding off beasts or animals that were trying to come into the flock and do damage to the sheep. So it's something that you could poke maybe a bear with, or poke an animal with, or just club something with. Whereas the staff was a little bit shorter and lighter, and something that they would use as they're walking through the, the sheep and just kind of tap them on the side, you know, hit them on the hind legs to get them going or to, to direct them where they wanted to go. So oftentimes they had two. Probably using his walking sticks as they were walking, but they each kind of had their own specific purpose, which I uh, didn't really remember or hear anyone mentioning before. That's possible that they had these uh, two staffs. So they, the shepherds carried around these implements to guide and protect the sheep. And so also Zechariah had these two staffs, one named Beauty, one named Bonds. And if you're in the King James, it's instead of bonds, it says bands. So B A N D S instead of B O N D S. So the names beauty and bonds suggest that he wanted the sheep or wanted the flock to enjoy God's favor or grace. So beauty, that staff called beauty, uh, also think of that as grace, God's grace. And to experience national unity. So think of that staff of bonds or bands as God wanting unity uh, among the nation of Israel, of his nation of people. Uh, and also uh, something I've uh, I read also was, according to Canaanite legend, obviously this is not scripture, uh, the god Baal, which we've read about in scripture, uh, was given two clubs, one named Driver and one named Chaser. Mm -hmm. So this god of Baal had two clubs. Uh, that he would use, driving a chaser to battle the dark deities of the sea. It is appropriate that God gave his messenger, Zechariah, has given shepherd staffs to guide the people instead of clubs for fighting. Um, so, just a little different piece of information there that I thought I'd share. Uh, more, important, more important to remember and uh, realize what the beauty and the bands is all about, which is going to come up a little bit later in scripture as well. Verse 8 and 9. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. That what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. That those that are left eat. 
other's flesh. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. So some have suggested that the three shepherds represented here at the very beginning of verse 8 uh, represents classes of rulers or classes of people in Israel. So uh, a couple of distinctions were made uh, from what I can see in my study Bible and uh, another pastor that I listened to. So was it basically the, the kings, priests, and prophets as the three shepherds that are being alluded to here? Or was it the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians that were mentioned here as the three shepherds? Um, it, uh, it actually came out in, in the, the audio teaching I was listening to that the scholars really aren't sure. And someone else even, someone else even suggested that they refer to the last three kings of Judah, uh, which were uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, because they were all came into power and out of power in 598 BC. So that could have been all in one month as well. Um, I'm not, I'd have to go back and I didn't go back and reread that portion of scripture to see if it was all that quickly, one month time. So that was another possibility of what these three shepherds were um, when those three kings came in and out of power so quickly. Uh, but even in my study Bible on page 620, it shows all the different kings in Judah and in Israel and it showed their timeline as all in 598 B.C. So a side note, how many kings of Judah and Israel were there? I think um, Steve mentioned this a couple, several weeks ago. But in my study Bible, it shows 20 kings that there were in Judah and exactly 20 kings that there were in Israel. So I thought I, I didn't really put that together. There was the same number of kings in both Judah and Israel spanning many different years. Israel ended in 722 B.C., and then Judah lasted another 150 years, roughly, uh, 586 B.C. And I think Steve also mentioned this, too, uh, weeks ago, was uh, how many good rulers were out of, those, out of those 40 different kings. In my Bible, it showed about seven. So that kind of seems like a good number. And all seven of those were in the Judah region, none in the Israel region. So basically all 20 rulers in the northern area called Israel were evil, bad rulers. Um, so that, that's amazing if, to, to go hundreds of years like they did and never have a, a good ruler. Very, very sad for them. But even in Judah, we only had 7 out of 20 kings. That's like 7 out of 20 presidents that were good presidents. Now just think of that, how, how hard it would be to, to raise your kids and raise families back in those days mm -hmm. uh, with evil influence constantly being around for hundreds of years. So a side note number two um, was this word of horde that you see I put in red here. The Hebrew word for this only shows up once in Scripture, and this is the passage where it shows up. If you do a, a, a search in Blue Letter Bible, like I did, for a horde, it came up like 16 times in the New King James. But then when I clicked on the, um, the concordance word, then it went to looking at Hebrew, and it showed just one, one passage, this passage. Word. So that, that word, I didn't write it down in Hebrew what it was, but that's a very unique word, and it's pretty rare, you know, that you come across a word in Scripture that's only used once. So I don't know if Steve knows or if anybody knows what the actual Hebrew, I should have wrote down what the Hebrew definition of the horde was, but I bet it's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. It's got to be pretty graphic. Mm -hmm. The fundamental meaning this particular lexicon uses, which is, Strong, it's a very strong importance. He says it's a primitive root, which means it doesn't have, it is not related to any other word. It is the most fundamental word. And he defines it as to loathe, which means to hate. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it seems like that word could have been used somewhere else in Scripture, but this is, I guess, I guess God wanted this one word to be used uh, in Hebrew. This is the place where it showed up. So my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. The Jewish Bible says they detested me. 
and test it if there's any. Yeah. Cool. All right. So pertaining to the phrase, let what is dying die, the judgment which God had um, decreed should be accepted, not resisted. So again, the Lord is telling him, Zechariah right here, let what is dying die. That is what is perishing perish. So just accept and not resist. Uh, this could be another reference to the cannibalism in 70 AD in Jerusalem at the hand of the Romans. That was dying, dying, that was perishing, perish. It's possible. Verse 10. And I took my staff, beauty, uh, and think of that also as grace, God's grace, and I cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. The breaking of the staff beauty symbolizes the end of God's protection of his disobedient people. Um, the staff beauty that was broken represents God's grace. Uh, God has made a, had made a covenant with his people that if they followed my laws and followed my ways, he would um, bless and prosper his people. But his people did not follow all of his statutes. <coughs> So breaking the covenant here may also refer to an agreement with the Gentile nation on Israel's behalf, or was what another uh, commentary said. Uh, but unlike God's unconditional promises to Abraham and to David, those would never be broken. But apparently there was some agreement that God was going to break, this covenant that he was going to break with all his peoples. Uh, and it was just, you know, just so many different instances we can go back in scripture of where God's chosen people constantly disobeyed. You know, one king they would follow and then the next king would be evil and they would just turn to their wicked ways and it was just constantly back and forth, back and forth. Remember the story of Moses constantly uh, praying, God, why did you give me these people? And God yeah, shout back and say, these are your people, not my people. And vice versa, Moses would say back to God. And then all the different stories of how they just refused to follow God's commandments. And then they would do it for 40 years, and then they would stop for 80 years, and just constantly back and forth. And that's kind of a, a covenant that we see. Uh, it's not the same as the unconditional promise to Abraham and David, but this, con uh, this covenant of grace that God had broke is, is now breaking with his people. Verse 11. So it was broken on that day, thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. It was broken on that day, thus the poor of the flock. This one I had a hard time coming up with uh, an explanation uh, for what this verse means. So I said this could be referring to some among the people that were not believers yet, that did come to accept Christ after they watched and saw and heard. Zechariah was saying, because I'm sure Zechariah was repeating and saying a lot of these things that he's been hearing from the Lord. Um, and so these, obviously, uh, that had to be happening. He had to be sharing this information because they knew it was from the Lord. So if they knew it was from the Lord, they had to be hearing it and agreeing with Zechariah that it was from the Lord. Verse 12. And I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah, taking the role of the messianic shepherd, requested his wages for all of his services that had been rendered. His wage was calculated as 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. This, we also know, was a price paid to Judas for betraying Jesus. And remember, this prophecy by Zechariah took place 500 years before Jesus. So where in Scripture have we seen this, uh, the same information uh, of 30 pieces of silver? Well, the first one was, why did I say it was the price of a slave? Back in Exodus 21, verse 32, it says, If the ox gores a male or female servant... He shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So if by accident, uh, if someone's servant uh, or slave had been killed by their, someone else's wild animal, 
in this case an ox. You know, they were supposed to repay money for this dead servant of 30 shekels of silver. So that's been called, you know, the price of a, of a slave. Um, and then also in Matthew uh, 27, we have four passages here. Let's go ahead and read through this. But the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they of the children of Israel Christ, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed them. So here's the, the just the, not confirmation, but just other examples of thirty pieces of silver um, being used. The first one, you know, the price of a, a slave servant, and then the second, uh, what Judas was essentially paid for allowing the Romans to come in and, and uh, entrap and uh, take into custody, basically, Jesus. Verse 13, And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. So the word potter keeps coming up oftentimes, and you know potters may have had a connection with the temple because of the continual need for sacred vessels. As we know, the priests always had to, to wash up uh, before and certainly after a lot of the things that they were required to do. So I'm sure there was water being, I mean, there was the great basin outside that they were to wash in, um, in around the temple. Um, I'm just speculating that they had to have vases of water and things that contain water, and so potters may have had a connection to the temple in such a way, uh, but, but basically it was the, the potter's field that was being referenced here. The potter's field was used to bury strangers in, as the verse of Matthew mentioned, but also the poor were also buried oftentimes in this potter's field. And uh, by coincidence, you know, the, the pottery shards were also uh, discarded in the same field. So when the potteries were doing their work, oftentimes they made mistakes, things didn't come out quite the way they were supposed to after being heated in the urn, um, and then sometimes they would just break them down to, and add more water and reuse it, and if something just wasn't able to be reused anymore, it was just it was broken into uh, very small pieces. Um, uh, I, I heard Pastor Chuck say they broke them down into really sh small shards so small that even if you threw it on the ground, that the pieces had to be small enough that it couldn't um, ladle up any water. Because if some poor person saw that and they needed a piece of pottery to scoop water out of a bowl or scoop water from a pitcher into a bowl, if it could be used as a ladle, it was too big. So if you were discarding pottery, you had to break it up into tiny, tiny, tiny pieces, and then they would just discard it into this potter's field. So it was used for burying and found to be useful. So these last two verses, verses 12 and 13, uh, also speak to the first coming of Jesus Christ and his rejection and being sold for 30 pieces of silver. So that's the, the main prophetic um, underlying tone that we see from the verses 12 and 13 where it mentions the 30 pieces of silver. And, uh, and again, I'll prophesy by Jeremiah and then repeated by, by Zechariah. Verse 14. Then I cut in two my other staff, bonds or bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. The second staff called bonds or bands was cut in two. Uh, the rejection of the messianic shepherd represented here by Zechariah meant that the national unity that Israelites hoped for would not be achieved at this time. They began to be scattered in uh, 70 AD after they were uh, conquered essentially by the Romans. Uh, and the name of their country was changed basically to Palestine at that point. So a lot of you may have already known this, but anybody that was born in Israel 
Jews that were born in Israel before 1948, which was the year when they became a, a recognized country once again, they were called Palestinians. So that's why you still hear that term a lot in the news, you know, Palestinians. But in 1948 is when they became a country again, and then the term Israel was officially allowed to be used again, so people could be called Israelis rather than Palestinians. Um, that's just a little piece of information a lot of people may not have picked up on, and there's a long history between, or not between, but a long history of explaining why the country was called Palestine. Uh, it was just kind of a jab at the Israelis basically, or the Jews from the Romans because of the hatred that the Jews had for the Philistines that they were always in battle with and I guess in the Hebrew language maybe there must have been some sort of similarity between the Philistines and the Palestines in the, in the Hebrew name I guess that it was so similar that they knew this would be irksome to, to the Jews to be called Palestines because the wording was so similar to Philistines, I guess. But something like that, they, the Romans knew that it was really going to be a thorn in the Jews' side to be called Palestinians rather than Israelis. And they, that's why they changed the country name. I'm sure there's a lot more story to that than what I just explained, but it was really the Romans getting back at the Jews even more by calling the country Palestine um, rather than Israel. So after 1948, as I mentioned, uh, the people, the Jews there can now be called Israelis again. And now we can go to Israel. I think a lot of people here in the room have been to a tour in Israel. And they can be taken on a tour by an Israeli of the Roman ruin. Roman ruins there in Jerusalem still. So I think that, I wonder if that's, God finds any uh, irony in this that it's just, we have Israel. The Romans came and conquered the Jews, the Israelis, and now the Romans are basically no longer around, but the Israelis are. And now the Israelis are the ones leading the tours and the ones that are prospering in the country that the Romans <coughs> at one point had conquered themselves. Verse 15. And the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. This is another one I... I didn't know what to, to, to make of completely. So I said foolish uh, could suggest a person who is a coarse and hearted fool. <coughs> I hate to use the word fool in the same kind of definition of foolish because it doesn't really help define uh, foolish much. But you know, we've, we've heard uh, foolish people sometimes are, uh, it, it's hard to explain to them. They're just not open minded enough to, to think that what they're doing is possibly wrong. Um, they're just not open to listening. So they're just a, a coarse and hardened fool, someone that's not really open to anything. Verse 16. For indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that stand, or that, nor feed those that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. So this verse is a prediction of the Antichrist. Note that this shepherd being raised up will not do all the things that Jesus will do. So notice where it says, will not care for those who are cut off, but Jesus will. Nor seek the young, but Jesus does. Remember how he just loved to have the kids come to him and even spend time with them nor heal those that are broken. But Jesus spent many hours with those that were broken and healed them, nor feed those that still stand, or still stand. And Jesus did do that. He stood with people. And he helped to feed them. You know, the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000. So this again is a, a, a prophetic glimpse of the Antichrist. Verse 17, Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. So the worthless shepherd will be judged. 
in the King James, once again, we have a, a different word there for worthless. It's the word idol, I-D-O-L. So the idol shepherd, not I-D-L-E. Something that's just kind of lazy, but the I-D-O-L shepherd in the King James who leaves the flock. His arm that's mentioned here, uh, which should have been used to protect the sheep, will wither, it says. So arm also is uh, kind of symbolic of a strength. And then his right eye, which should have watched over the sheep, will be blinded. Uh, the right eye could have, there often is symbolic of intelligence or wisdom and ability to rule. So we also know in uh, later in Revelation that the Antichrist will be mortally wounded, but his deadly wound will actually be healed. So this could be a prophetic uh, foreshadowing also of the Antichrist, talking about his arm and his eye being wounded, but then healed. So I tried to come up with a life lesson for this whole chapter, and God will sometimes allow sin to take its toll. God will sometimes, probably always, allow sin to take its toll. Meaning sin has consequences. The people of Israel, the people of Judah, uh, us, <coughs> everyone that's ever lived, has sinned in some way, shape, or form at one point in time. Um, oftentimes, which is a blessing probably, we see the immediate effect of those consequences. Um, depending on the type of sin that it is, you know, you may immediately be arrested and put into jail. I mean, that's the consequence. Sometimes a sin that we commit is so, not minor, but is so unseen for whatever reason or just not perceived until much later. But there's going to be consequences. You may have to live with what you did for 20 years before you're found out type thing. And that type of emotional stress and strain and just destroy some people. Uh, and then they just kind of blurt it out or they do something else in an effort to almost get caught for something else because of something they did years in the past. But, you know, just think of yourself, think of your kids. There are little things that they do wrong or little sins that you commit or have committed. Hopefully not, we're not repeating these more sins nowadays that we used to do. We've learned from them and don't do the same sins anymore oftentimes. It's just little things that creep in, maybe. Sin has consequences. There's always going to be consequences to our sin. And the people of Judah and Israel um, and everyone uh, has to, to somehow cope with that and ask for forgiveness. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're seeing here. Judah has been ruled for many, many, not eons, but hundreds of years by evil uh, wicked shepherds or rulers and Zechariah is pointing this out in the last two chapters about the evil shepherds that have been around and now we're starting to see some prophetic instances of yeah you're, this land that we're living in now uh, we're going to be living in it for another 500 years but eventually and this is after they've already come back from Babylon they've already been punished for a lot of their sins by being exiled to Babylon for 70 years. Now they're back. But then again, the land is going to be uh, taken over uh, by the Romans. And then there's going to be the big diaspora where they're just going to be spread throughout the rest of the world in 70 AD when the Roman takes over once again because of their uh, sinfulness. So God will sometimes allow sin to take its toll um, because every sin has a consequence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this time once again. And, uh, Lord, I pray that there's uh, something in, the, in, the, in your word here tonight, Lord, that uh, will inspire someone to go and to read more about it, to learn more. Uh, as, I always, as, as I always am listening in every teaching, to, to hear something that I hopefully haven't heard before, that I can go investigate and see if it's, uh, not if it's true or not, but just more about what that topic is. And uh, Lord, we should all be doing that. Lord, help us to continue to be diligent to be in your word. And 
And Lord, I just pray that you would um, bless each and every man here tonight, Lord, as we leave and go our separate ways. Uh, Lord, thank you for the hearts of the men here, Lord, as they've been diligent to keep coming out on Tuesday nights to hear men's, men's studies. And Lord, just partake in the fellowship and to partake in hearing your word. And Lord, I just, uh, again, thank you for this opportunity that's provided here at the, the Bridge Fellowship. Just continue, continue Lord, to protect and to guide and to provide uh, for the families that continue to come here and Lord just bless us all, draw us closer to each other and closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.